Good evening. My name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing at the Kansas City Public Library, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this latest installment in our, for now, virtual uh, signature event series. Before we get started, I should mention, if at any point you have questions, you can put those in the chat box on the YouTube page, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Tonight, we have a great conversation plan centered on a new documentary, A Most Beautiful Thing. Let's take a look at the trailer. In the late 90s, the west side of Chicago was not a good place to grow up. It was like a war zone. Some people asked what college you're going to go to when you grow up. In that neighborhood, the big question was what gang you're going to join. A kid got shot in front of Manly, killed him dead right on the curb. It kind of makes you lose hope for your community. How do you break out of that? But a chance encounter changed everything. I walk inside the lunch room and I see this boat. I didn't even know what Roar was. We don't even swim. Are you going to take some West Side kids over to the lake? Nah, that's not going to work. It brought guys from different neighborhoods, from rival gangs, together in one boat. When it's calm and you're out there, it take your mind away from any problems that you have. It brightened my life. There was something about the water that gave us peace, and we all needed that. Now, 20 years later, they're back on the water. What are we training for here? Chicago Sprints. We're trying to rewrite history here. Training starts and they are shape. Malcolm's doing this to show his son another way. Preston's going back in time to undo his mistakes. Alvin's racing to celebrate the fact he's still alive, that he's still here. Now you get an opportunity to inspire another generation. What are you going to do with it? We on the mission now. It's going to be a remarkable moment when they come together and get to that starting line again. Brothers encouraging brothers. That needs to spread like wildfire through our communities. What he's doing is a beautiful thing. When that flag comes down, there's only one truth, that they are still here. Manly! Go! It's a wonderful story and it's beautifully told and we're excited to learn more about it from our guest tonight. An award-winning documentary film director, Olympic athlete and former law firm partner, Mary Mazio is founder and CEO of 50 Eggs Inc., an independent film production company dedicated to making socially impactful films. She's joined this evening by one of the subjects of her latest film, Arshay Cooper. In 1997, he joined and later became captain of the first African-American high school rowing team. Since then, he has started several rowing programs across the country for youth from under-resourced neighborhoods. His memoir, A Most Beautiful Thing, was republished on June 30th by Flatteron Books. Our moderator tonight is Sherman Weitz. Sherman is a director in education for the Ewing Miriam Kaufman Foundation, where he is responsible for managing philanthropic investments related to K-12 education. Mary, Arshe, Sherman, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Delighted to be here, thank you. Steve, thank you so much. I'm Sherman. Good evening to everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening. I am excited to have both Mary and Arche here, authors of both memoir and film, uh, a, be a most beautiful thing. Uh, let's just kick it off. Arche, after 20 years, 20 years, what inspired you to revisit your high school days, uh, which were far from perfect, according to the movie, I mean, you all didn't win that year, but it was still a special year in your life. What inspired you to write your memoir kind of centered around this topic of rowing? Yeah, you know, rowing uh, is a special sport, you know, but it was the, the vehicle that our coaches used to, to bring change and opportunities um, to us. And, you know, we've been through a lot, right? We um, grew up in a neighborhood where we lost a lot of friends. We have uh, heard gunshots when we slept almost every night. We skipped over pools of blood, and and then you know, and, and, and experienced a lot, a, a lot, a lot of trauma on the west side of Chicago. And every year, you know, I would go back and speak to kids from my elementary school, high schools, and other friends' high school, and young kids are still going through the same things that we're going through. And um, and what I noticed 
about my city and I always know this and Mary said so beautiful is that, you know, talent is everywhere, but it's access and opportunity that it's not. And I wanted to tell the story of a group of talented young people and how they rise and how they became local heroes uh, because of opportunity. And I also want to talk about when those opportunities presents itself, what are some of the systemic obstacles? You know, what are some of the hesitations, right, that happens uh, in our community like, you know, money or not being able to swim, uh, you know, transportation and, and a million other different things uh, that, that comes with that. And so, and, and lastly, to inspire young people, to let them know, yes, we had a hard, it was tough, it was rough, uh, but we rise above it, right? And we overcame our fears and we backed each other up and, 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 and we made some challenging decisions, right? And so, uh, that's the reason why I want to put this story out there and uh, excited that uh, Mary found it. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Hey, Mary, what was it about our safe story that piqued your interest and made you uh, think, hey, this could be a, a great film? Honestly, everything. Um, I mean, I read his memoir in a nanosecond and I've been kicking around the sport for a while. I didn't know that there was a team on the west side and so somebody said hey this guy like has this self-published memoir have you heard of it i'm like no i order it on amazon and i uh i tweeted about it and uh, our shade tweets back and that was it baby i mean we were and interestingly we were in the middle of launching our last film it was a film called i am jane doe that catalyzed bipartisan change and bipartisan legislation so it, there, there was so much happening. And when Arshay's tweet rocketed back, and then I think Arshay, you and I were on the phone maybe the next day. I mean, look, Arshay and I share some of the ge same genetic material that all rowers share, right? We're not the fast downhill skiers. You know, we don't wear the cool clothes. We're not the cool kids. It's all about the grind. And so for me, what was really exciting was the opportunity to share the journey with Arche um, and really just to amplify his voice. And one that I knew instantly was special and instantly was a clarion call on so many different levels. And, and honestly, uh, I was, you know, Arche Cooper or Planet Arche is an, an amazing place <laughs> where people come together that have no business coming together, right? And so it's like our is the Pied Piper of extraordinary things happening. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm with, <laughs> I'll have what he's having. And so I hopped on to the Arche train and, and honestly, I had no idea where it would take us, but um, I knew that it would be to a place where we can, we could explore, as Arche said before, the systemic challenges and obstacles to many of our citizens around the country and frankly, around the globe right, that live in conditions not of their own making, an accident of birth. And um, and we'll talk about this later, but that is sort of reframed for a lot of people, myself included, um, the obligations of privilege. Now, speaking of people hopping on the train, you all got some uh, pretty heavy hitting co-producers of this film, Grant Hill, Dwayne Wade, I saw Arnie Duncan in the film. What motivated these athletes and celebrities to, to get involved in this project? So honestly, I think um, everyone had a profound reason. And I think, you know, Grant said to me, um, and, and, and Arshay, uh, you can talk about what Common said when we, you know, when we um, got together with him. But Grant said to me, he's like, what did you just tell me? Like rowing on the west side? Did I hear you right? And he said, you know, Mary, there are so few pieces of media out there that depict a positive portrayal of young men of color from neighborhoods, whether it's Harlem, Compton, um, everything that is produced is um, through a certain lens that, that often can reinforce really damaging stereotypes and tropes and and grant said i love these guys i love the story it's authentic it's heartbreaking but it's funny it's unexpected and at the end of the day it's a beautiful portrayal of young men from these neighborhoods and so i was excited to be part of that yeah and i think too like you know sherman uh meeting common was like a dream right this guy from chicago and 
it was uh yeah it was awesome just to have his voice uh you know and i think for him you know the oh the moment i met him he's right away he's he knew manly high school he said manly was a, is a crazy high school man and you know uh, and i think the fact that you know not just you know people play basketball football as a way to to, to get out um to become successful and take care of their families right and and they love the sport but it, for him it was like this foreign sport that didn't just bring together a group of guys who love it, but a group of guys from different gangs, right? And he was like, that story was a story of people who didn't like each other and, and came together around this sport that, you know, you know, and a lot of you young guys had a lot of fear around it, but you showed up and that caught his attention, right? And and um, so it was good to have him uh, uh, just a part and it, it, was, it was awesome. Now, Arshay, this this movie is obviously about a rowing team, which involves being on the water. Uh, talk to us about your relationship with water. And then it is a sub theme. There's a sub narrative in this movie about black people's relationship with water. Talk talk me through that. Uh, I mean, I had no relationship with the water, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I think seven, uh, seven, ninth Wanda brought up a, a interesting point that you know, when it comes to black people, the relationship with water is water baptism, right? That's like brings together a new life. And that's the only relationship he really knew with water. And, um, but for me, you know, we didn't have access to, to water, right? Our communities were far away from the lake, far away, away from the river. And we, we didn't have access to a swimming pool. But, you know, I think um, for me, I tried out for the basketball team. And because the way I grew up, running, being chased, and all those different things, uh, when someone hit me, I wanted to fight. It triggered a lot of trauma. I was upset. And the coach was like, knock them dead, and, and you, know, you want to fight. And then basketball was uh, a trash-talking sport, and I wasn't that good. And people would say, you suck, you garbage, you're not good. And those are things that I heard growing up from even teachers, right? And it triggered a lot of trauma, and I wanted to fight. Uh, but once I got into the sport, and learn how to swim, um, uh, and but we, you know, we go to the water, and there's still a lot of fear there. But finally, we're downtown for the first time, a lot of us. And when you go out there, fear tells you, right? In order to get back to that dock safely, you better pull for each other. That's what fear said to me, and and, and I think we all build this connection on the water because we didn't want to drown, right? And to build that connection, you have to be quiet. And there's one voice, it's the coxswain or the coach on a lunch. And they're telling you to follow the person behind you. They're telling you to breathe. They're telling you to sit tall, right? And, and it's completely quiet, you know? And you're not, you don't have to worry about gunshots. You're not hearing police sirens. There's, you know, there's no bullying. And then really you begin to develop this magical rhythm, the sound of the blade hitting the water, the sound of the waves, right? Uh, the sun just pressing against your face and you're working hard and it is pure meditation every single day for two hours that woof, woof. and you know I always say that teachers will call young people at our school a walking storm but I say that this sport was the one sport that calmed the storm in us and the moment we got out of that step out of that boat we were at peace just stretching and, and excited and, and 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 finally getting that two hours to reflect every day uh was perfect and so um we couldn't wait to get to the water there were days they would cancel practice and we would show up on and get in kayaks and just sit in kayaks and talk right there in the water so we develop a strong bond a strong relationship with the water now for those of us who are novices uh in rowing uh please real quickly explain what a coxswain is a coxswain is uh, the person who actually sits, you can say the front or the back of the boat, the front of the boat. He's, the coxswain is the person that directs the boat, right? It steers the boat, makes sure the boat is going um, straight in the right direction, making sure that we don't hit a brick wall. Um, they're really leading us, uh, uh, hopefully, to, to, to that goal or, or to that win. <laughs> uh, I believe it was you, Arshe, that uh, who spoke about in the movie that you are used to the sounds of gunshots and violence and ambulance sirens, but not the serenity of water. So it's interesting to hear you just describe uh, it in a serene way. Prior to the first time rowing, did you ever notice 
the physical beauty of Chicago? I did not, you know, um, I just knew what was in front of me, right? I seen, the only thing I've seen was the Sears Tower from a distance when you walk across the expressway, right? And and I knew it was there and I've never stepped foot and just hung out downtown until I was 15, until I was introduced to the sport of rowing, right? And and it, it's sad because in our community now, it, you know, it, it is a neglected community. We, there wasn't a lot of basketball courts, there wasn't a lot of parks, right? Uh, there wasn't a lot of things to do. And I knew, you heard about it, there are, um, great things going on in different parts of the city, right? One thing I wrote, one thing I wrote in my book, I said, it's like God exists everywhere, but here, you know? And, and, um, but it wasn't until I get, you know, uh, a group of people came to our school and wanted to give us a shot at new sport. Now, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I'm going to start with you, Arshade, and come over to Mary. Yeah. Uh, but there was this quote in the movie, this line that, that just caught my attention. Someone said, um, maybe in Preston, they said it was dangerous being in the game, but it was even more dangerous not being in the game. Talk to me about the chronic trauma associated with having to live this reality as a child and then as, as an adult. I'm assuming, I'm assuming you still live in Chicago, I'm not sure where about, but, but talk to me about that trauma. And then I'm going to ask a similar question to you, Mary. Yeah, I would say, sure. Well, you know, I, I do live in New York right now, but I spend a lot of time in Chicago. Um, you know, whenever there's a mass shooting in in, um, in in the suburban school, right away you would see that they and they would say it that they would send trauma counselors in, which they should, right? And even nowadays, if you get a divorce, people have resources. Uh, the kids, the kids see a therapist, right? And and to step outside, to lose friends all the time, to to experience gunshots, to 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 run for your life. We experience what most soldiers have experienced in war before we were 15 years old. So all you're thinking about is surviving, right? And that we, that, I mean, legit PTSD, right? Uh, I had dreams all the time of being chased or, or being shot. And that was, I have never seen a school counselor. No one on my team have never talked to a counselor or a therapist about what we've seen and how we grew up and who we lost because of the lack of, of resources. And, 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 you know, and it's, it's not only the trauma that I experience every day, my grandmother experienced that trauma in the South. And because her friend was hung on a tree, she moved to Chicago in the early 60s, right? And Malcolm Mothers um, experienced the same thing, right, in the South. And so the, Congressman Danny Davis said Chicago West Side was built on trauma, right? All these families that came from came from the South to West side of Chicago for a better life because of what they've been through and what they saw um, because of Jim Crow laws and segregation, right? And they come to Chicago in a red line. You still live in a certain community where you can't take out a mortgage or you can't get a loan and uh, you know what I mean? And, 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 and poor resources, right? And everyone's trying to survive. And so what they've been through, they never talked to anyone about what they've seen or what they've been through or their church being bombed, right? Um, and so the, the trauma that they went through, we also kind of paid for it, you know what I mean? And, and, and that continues in our city. Um, and so I am thankful that although we didn't have the resources, because of access and opportunity, the water was a way to reduce my trauma. Outdoor sports is a way to reduce that trauma. Love that answer. Now, now, Mary, I'm thinking about how how trauma from childhood is still playing out in the lives of these men today. Can you talk about you talk about what you want with regards to trauma? But yeah, I, I, mean, I have a specific question around some of the challenges in completing the project related to the trauma. Well, yes, I think um, I think the most surprising thing that I learned as a person who <coughs> didn't come from money but came from privilege, came from a safe neighborhood, was when Arshe took me on a ride around with Alvin, right? Right before we were starting the project, Arshe said, Arshe said, all right, come to my city, you know, uh, you know, that Patriots hat you might have, like, no, that, that don't play, that's not gonna play here. Um, 
And so he and Alvin met me at the airport and we drive to the West side and we start at Arshay's house and we're driving to school. And, you know, Alvin's like, okay, here are the BDs here and the GDs and the conservative vice lords. And when you visit the topography of a place like the West side, you understand um, and you can see the physical layout that young people ages eight, nine, 10, that have to navigate these boundaries. Um, this idea that young people that affiliate with gangs as a conscious choice is a fallacy. It just simply is not how it works. In fact, I was talking with somebody a few weeks ago who had been incarcerated and he said to me, he said to me, Mary, it's like osmosis. He said, because it's not even uh, what gang are you in? It's where do you live? Um, and where you live, right? As Arshe was saying before, it defines who you are, it is automatically assumed that you are part of a gang as a young person. And these young people making these decisions to survive at eight, nine, 10, or 11 with profound consequences, right, is so patently undemocratic, unfair. And when I look back and look at the safety that I grew up in and the profound unsafe, never mind income, the income gap, the basic safety gap. And I think, you know, there's new research around trauma that it's now passed down. I mean, Arshay said it was legit PTSD, 100%. And that is now passed down genetically and epigenetically. So when you couple that sort of gun violence in the present day with the intergenerational trauma that Arshay talked about, and, and that, that was mind blowing to me because I think most of America will make the assumption, oh, it happened 400 years ago. Like, you know, and, and in fact, I'll never forget, Arshe, the, the first conversation with your mother at the Burger King, and she starts laying down how she grew up, what happened to her as a young child, paying for the trauma of her father, right? In, in excruciating and profound ways, and then talking with Malcolm's mother, and you realize, whoa, 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 this is one generation away where these citizens, right, experienced white domestic terrorism, and whether it was seeing a family member hung from a tree, I mean, or Malcolm's mother described men on horses with rifles running after her as a four-year-old. That is just inconceivable. Um, to think about one generation away. And so I think that piece around trauma as a person who resides in the world of privilege, I think that's one thing that um, we've been really excited to see the film kind of create a greater understanding of these deeply entrenched um, and undemocratic um, impediments. Love it. Uh, Arshay, uh, back in high school, you just you told one of your teammates that rowing is stronger than the gang and I, I that was a salient line for me i saw rowing as a metaphor for something to do something to belong to uh and and, and you know a substitute if you will for gang life why do you think there is not a greater investment in after school sports or arts or, or, or things to do whether it be rowing or anything else I think you're on mute, sir. I'm um, sorry. Uh, no, great question. You know, I, and I, I'm a big advocate for after school. You know, I think school is super important. We all know that that for the 630 time is a time for risky behavior, right? For that's the time where people are getting jumped or jumped in the gang or teenage pregnancy or people are just getting involved with things that they shouldn't, you know, parents are at work, you know what I mean? Working two jobs. And so, after school should be something that everyone will want to want to invest in. And I think that for me, it, it it's still just lack of lack of resources and and people not really understanding the importance of after school. You think about the scene when we was in the barbershop, Sherman, and Pooh said, when they tore down the YMCA, I ran to the streets. And I remember that YMCA, right? It was like 150 kids there every day. Alvin was playing chess who was playing basketball, the counselors were there, coaches were there, and 
the place lost funding. And now those 150 kids are out hanging in the street. And there's the gang. And, and you, we talked about brotherhood. People want to belong. Who just want to belong? And a guy was like, hey, I buy you your first pair of Jordans. You know what I mean? And, and But rowing came to our school, right? And, and Poop joined the rowing team, right? And so for me, um, I, I, I made that statement just because of the turnaround that I've seen that uh, some of these guys made, not just them, but those who are involved in, in, in other after-school activities. And I see it every day today. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's these stories that are not being, it took 20 years to tell my story. And people heard it and everyone wants to give, right? To that very same mission. And there are not enough of these stories being told to really touch the hearts of people. How can we get them out there? I am thankful. I tweeted out to a lot of directors, a lot of people for a long time. And Mary answered, you know, Mary answered my tweet, right? And so I think that how can people like Grant Hill and Dwayne Wade can use their platform to tell more of these stories, to touch more hearts, and really answer questions that people of privilege have, answer questions uh, uh, for people who are curious and don't understand. And I think these great stories that are told by them, not by a director, Mary got out of the way and she let us and our moms tell our story, right? And I think when it's that authentic, uh, it begins to speak in open hearts. You know, and, and just to follow up on what Arshay said, and it leads Sherman back to your original question about trauma during the making of the film. I think what was mind blowing for me was the depth to which um, you had these young men sharing some of the most intimate pain. And we did a test screening for a young, um, a young girl, she was about 10th grader, maybe ninth grader from Roxbury, right? So, um, you know, a, a, a neglected neighborhood. And she said, she stood up and she said, I don't see male vulnerability in my community. Like this is, I've never seen anything like it. And I think that, that courage to be vulnerable and share pain um, was extraordinary. And I certainly did not appreciate that at the time, right? Until this young, you know, this young 10th grader said, wait, 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 this is something really special and different. Um, I did not anticipate how privileged I was, we were, that um, Arshea, his mother, Malcolm, Preston, Pookie, their mothers to share their pain and their joy, um, but how remarkable that was. On the topic of vulnerability, I'd like to, to throw in an audience question uh, to Arshe. Uh, someone wants to know, how did your involvement in rowing play at the time, at that time in your neighborhood with the gangs specifically? Was that accepted? Was it challenged? Were you teased around that? Talk to us about I, I that. I mean, yeah, yeah, we were roast all the time. I mean, people were singing, row, row, row your boat as we walk down the stairs, you know what I mean? They weren't making fun of us. There were people who was like, man, those, you know, those white guys, you know, and we, we had black coach and this coach, but they, people would say, those white guys got you out there rowing like you in slave ships, you know? Like we heard a lot of painful stuff and, uh, you know, people, you know, really talked about us. And, um, and so it, it, was, it, it was rough for us as young men because we got it in our communities because it was new. And uh, we and it wasn't a popular sport, and and we was also really stared at, and 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 and, and the rowing community because we were the first in the Midwest to, uh, you know, uh, well the first there in, in the sport in high school to a group of people that looked like us. So we had it rough, but I think that um, it, it's funny that the film came out, and all those very same people who are on Facebook and Instagram now they are forcing their kids to watch the film. They're like, you better watch this. And our shape, my kid needs to row. How do I get my kids rowing? You know, and so, um, you know, it, and it wasn't just because of the sport. You know, obviously we didn't go around talking about, you know, our stories or our mother was a drug addict or we experienced this at home. But I think what, what speaks to them and the kids is really knowing what we endure and, and, and still showed up and still competed and still race, right? And so, um, uh, that was that was that was super important. So after this amazingly enlightening year for you in high school, 
your rowing coach, I think his name is Ken, he thinks that the program, he, he kind of assesses it as a failure in year one. Financially, uh, they couldn't build support for the effort. There was no opportunity to brag about student outcomes. Did any of you enroll in college? I, I, I don't recall, uh, but, but there were these entrepreneurship classes that you all were taking. And yeah. Say more about say more about all the intangibles. Yeah, done. yeah. I would say to you, you know, those guys, Ken, those guys had great hearts, but they were young, right? Um, you know, they all were in their early twenties, and I think that my advice that I give to people who start a nonprofit that uh, that is not a person of color is that I get a chance to know the community and learn the community and what they want because you know. Rowers, sometimes they measure success by winning gold medals, right? And getting to a really good college. But for our community and for our families, showing up to the boathouse every day was a win. Getting people from different gangs to become a brotherhood is a huge win. Overcoming the fear of, of water is a win, right? College visits, sitting in entrepreneurship class. So those were all wins and success in, in, in our books and in, in, in our community um, really in, in, embraced that. Uh, but I think that, you know, some of the guys did go to college. I, I went to culinary school and uh, Pookie went to community college and, and, and stuff like that. But I think on the west side of Chicago, you know, we're like, yeah, we'll be on this team, but we need to make money. You know what I mean? It's to keep them, keep us, you know, he was like, all right, we'll t I'll teach you guys how to make money. Right. And, 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 um, and I think Ken was, I love the fact that it wasn't just okay, we're gonna do a rowing program and tutoring. He's like, no, this is actually a smart group of kids. We're gonna do entrepreneurship, right? And, and the goal for Ken was that not only we sit in entrepreneurship class and learn about the economy, learn about the market, learn how to shake someone's hand, learn how to look each other in the eye, right? Um, but to, it, 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 you know, sign a checkbook, but really know what's in, what knowing the community, what are the lack of resources in the community? What are the companies that don't exist that you feel like you need? And how can you do that here and stay here? And that's what those guys did. Like everything we learned, right? In, 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 those, in those classes every single Thursday, uh, we actually use that, right? 90% of our team are entrepreneurs. And, 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 and it was right there in those classes, right? Where we learn that our grandmothers may need this or the young kids need this, you know? And so, um, that's uh, it, it. It it really paid off, and and uh, it really just kind of activated the entrepreneurial mindset that we all had. Like, there's a lot of people on the west side who are drug dealers, and and, and but they would be the, the best entrepreneurs in in, in 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 the city, right? But they just didn't have the opportunity. We needed something to um to activate the entrepreneurial mindset, and that's what those courses did for us, and um and it all paid off. Yeah, I love it. And we were, we were conversing earlier. Uh, and Mary, I think you had some thoughts on entrepreneurship as well. You, would you like to share? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, we have so many pockets around the country where we've got never, you know, we talked about um, profound inequality of basic safety. How about access to the formal economy? Simply doesn't exist, right? And that goes back to what Arshe was saying, is how do you survive? You've got all kinds of entrepreneurial um, spirit, right, that runs through these communities in ways both big and small. And I think, you know, we did a project a couple of years ago, actually supported by the Kauffman Foundation, where it was a, um, a business plan competition with young people from Harlem, Compton, you know, Roxbury, uh, you know, South Side of Chicago. And it was amazing to see the ingenuity and innovative thinking, all young people who had no access to the formal economy and really no access to higher education, right? And so you think about entrepreneurship, it is a way to forge a path forward that I think can be really um, uh, destiny changing. You get no argument from me, from the yeah, call. No, honestly, and, and, and I think so many of us that live in the world of privilege, again, um, we'll look at a community with a certain lens and see only the negative, right? Instead of saying, wait, we have a huge reservoir of untapped talent, unbelievable um, work ethic, extraordinary intelligence, right? And as Arshay said before, I think the movie really stands for the simple proposition. 
that talent is everywhere. And yet it's, it's the lifelines that, that are thrown. Those are not everywhere. I mean, your comments about privilege are a great segue to another audience question or comment and question. I think there is a misconception in parts of the white community about what privilege is. Do you think this film will help people understand that privilege doesn't mean your skin color guarantees success or failure, but that, that there are some opportunities that simply don't exist for some people in this country? Yes, great question. And I think we, what's really exciting is we're now doing events with um, corporate executives, CEOs, and we're finding that the film is unlocking a greater understanding of the structural impediments that face citizens in places like the West Side. And, you know, for me, you know, you've heard this kind of like check your privilege, right? I think that started being used maybe five years ago. And I remember when I first heard it, I'm like, what the hell is that? Like, that's offensive. Like I pulled myself up by the bootstraps, right? And in reality and working with our Shea, um, there is no such thing as pulling yourselves up by the bootstraps, right? So I, as I said before, I didn't come from money. Um, I was very lucky to see the inside of a college. And my mother used to say, um, boy, Mary, you're always there when the bus comes, right? Meaning I had opportunity. And I know for a fact that that bus never would have stopped if my skin color were different. I know that for a fact. And so this idea um, around privilege and how um, we have been given, we didn't pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. I was given lifelines. And I was bestowed with gifts big and small by virtue of the color of my skin. I write like period, full stop. And I think um, I think what we're seeing the film do and really our Shay's articulation of these impediments, right? Um, in ways where people in the world of privilege are, are having a deeper understanding and saying, oh, I, boy, I've been lucky. Boy, is this fair, right? I've been given advantages that others have not. So as a person of privilege, and I've been thinking about this as well, what more can I do? How lucky I've been, again, by accident of birth, right? Um, and how much more I can do because that privilege is simply limited. Mary, as a filmmaker, how do you choose the stories that you tell? Are there certain stories or themes that inspire you more than others? Yes. Um, I love the underdog, right? I love the stories that are unexpected. And, you know, we did a story about some young, a few years ago, young undocumented boys. They were 16 year old boys from Arizona, um, undocumented that built a robot and they ended up beating MIT in a sophisticated underwater, underwater robotics competition. Like what, how did that happen? I love that. And what's fascinating is it's not really the stories I tell. And I remember a comment in, in the making of that film that veered into all of these young people were activists around DACA, around Dreamers, around the DREAM Act. And, um, and the film veered in that direction. And someone said, boy, why did you do that? And I was like, it's not my story, right? I need to be, and I, I, I think, I feel very strongly in this particular instance, you know, our Shea directed this movie, like make no mistake, this is our Shea's movie. And I just brought some people together to make it happen. Like, I really believe that that's my job, right? That this is his story, it's his mother's story, um, and it's his community's story. And I'm just lucky to bring people together to amplify that voice so that his voice can reach those who have the levers of power in this country. And how exciting is that? Arshay, what other lessons uh, in leadership did you learn from rowing that, that yeah. you need right now? Yeah, that was a, a, a couple, you know, I think number one, individually, all those guys, Alvin Preston and Malcolm were all leaders in many different ways. And I think the, the first thing Rowan did was took all these leaders and made them followers, right? Meaning basically we um, learned, right? It, it, we, we had our own ways of thinking, how we wanted to train, how we wanted to work out. 
And so it, the first thing it taught us how to learn, how to follow each other, how to listen, right? Um, the second um, thing for me is that it taught me that, you know, there's eight people that can run a boat and there's four people. And um, it taught me that I cannot do the work of eight people, but I need eight people to do the work and we'll get there much faster. How to get together a team, how to take different talents and get them to move together as one, right? And, and, and that's the same lesson I use with the cops, right? My community is like a four pulling the eight. Now, how can I get everyone working together so we can get to where we need to be faster, right? And, and that takes learning, right? That takes trust. That takes really getting a chance to know every single person, right? Um, and, I, and, and I learned that when I showed up at Alvin's house every day. I did not like him at first. He was fighting all the time, right? But, you know, I, I, I got a chance to know him, and, and that was very important. And questions, just simple questions like, you know, what keeps you up at night? You know, what keeps you going, right? every individual and that I use that leadership role and all those things I learned as a chef, as a community worker and many different things. And I will say, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Michael Jordan. You know, it was Michael, the Bulls, the nineties, we were rowing, the Bulls were winning championships. And what I love most about Michael Jordan is that everyone knew he was the hardest worker on the team. Everyone knew he was the best basketball on, on the team. And any athlete or any worker would tell you that we know who the hardest worker is at our job. We know who the hardest working person is on the team. They just wanted a little bit more maybe than everyone else, right? But that doesn't make you great. What Jordan did was how can I get everyone else on my team to want it just as much as I do? But he had to get a chance to know every individual and their strength and their weaknesses to get them to move together and then to win. And so, um, I learned that in rowing. I learned that from Michael. And I say the last thing, uh, one of the last things I would say, which is very important for me, the it was the first lesson. And that was how to like leave the boathouse better than you found it. Right. And I'm like, I didn't make this mess, right? Like, like, why well, have to clean this, right? And what the coach said is like, listen, when you leave this boathouse better than you found it, you make it easier for the next group that's coming in, right? And not only that, we have to leave it better than we found it, even if we didn't make the mess. And that's the way I lived my life. How do I make this sport? How do I make my community? How do I leave this Zoom? How do I leave my workplace better than I found it, even if I, did, if, even if I didn't make the mess? And so if we can wake up every morning and say, hey, I'm going to leave my job, my family, my day, my sport, better than I found it. Even if I didn't make the mess, it makes it easier for the next generation that is coming up, right? And so it's that simple. I want the world, I want my job, I want my sport to be better because I'm here. And, 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 and that's leadership, right? And regardless of what you go through, regardless of how hard it is, regardless if you didn't make the mess, you rise up and you mobilize and you get everyone to, to leave it better than they found it. And so that's, uh, those are some of the key things I learned in, through the sport that I use every day in my life. I love the Jordan reference. I, I would reference Tom Brady, but it's just, it's just too soon. Uh, <laughs> I, know Mary's, I know Mary's from Boston, but you know. <laughs> This too soon. Uh, one of the most impactful lines in this movie, and I'm trying not to give it away because I know some people are going to be watching this who haven't seen it yet. They've seen a trailer, and I want, I really think they should, they're going to enjoy this movie, right? So I'm not going to give it away. But one of the most important lines to me uh, was when the former Olympic rowing coach, you all are grown men now, and you're, you're getting back in the boat, and he says to the crew while, while teaching a, an improving, uh, improved rowing technique, he says, you don't have to be perfect, just approximately correct. <laughs> is this an axiom for life? I'm asking the both of you. What, what, what do you, you think can... about that line? They just dropped I, that line. I was like, Whoa. It's hilarious. And I think it's so true, right? Perfect can be the enemy of good. And it's sort of, this is perfect for our Shay, one of our Shay's other lessons is, you know, what can you do in your community? You don't have to do it all. You don't have to go solve the, you know, the racial inequity problem, but you have to do one thing, right? You pick up a brick, 
you do the best you can, you lay the brick, you get some others to pick up some bricks. And you know what, maybe you have a little bit of a bumpy bridge, but you're building the bridge and it's not perfect. And it's, it's all about the effort. And I, I love that. Um, I love that you picked up on that too, Sherman. That is just <laughs> hilarious. And I think, you know, we're all in our silos, right? You're worrying about whether it's a job or your mortgage or your rent or, 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 or. And I think um, Arshay's leadership is really about looking out into the community. What more can I do? And it doesn't have to be perfect. Arshay, before you respond, I, not only did I pick up on it, I'm sitting here watching a movie with my 10 year old and she's, she didn't understand what he meant, but she knew that was important. So I had yeah. to stop the movie and explain to her what that meant. She knew, but like it struck her as well. And she's like, wait, I don't really understand. <laughs> Run that back. Stop the movie and talk about it, right? I love it. I love what it. did it mean to you, Arshay? No, you know, for me, it, it's what I always reference, right? I think that, um, and, and, and I think that when we first started, all we kept talking about is we needed to be perfect, right? How do we, how, you know, be, so our community can see us. But I think Mary said that the way I, you know, one of the ways I live my life and the advice I always give to companies or groups or teams that say, you know, we're going to wake up tomorrow and our company or our job is going to be more diverse and, and more about social justice. And we're going to build this bridge and it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be perfect. Like, no, no. And that's what Mike Teddy was saying. Don't start there. But if you can wake up tomorrow, right. And lay that one brick as perfect as you can. And for me, it may be connecting with CPD, right. But Preston, it may be cutting the shorties here in the community, right? And having conversations and dialogue. But Alvin, it is, right? Giving the seniors high, the seniors in high school uh, that move in jobs so they can pay for their proms and they can pay for their graduations, right? For some people, it's it's starting like um, at their company, uh, amazing King Day uh, give back, right? So I think, you know, even with, he was talking about simply with the ERG and stuff like that, but if, with your talent, with your gifts, right? and not really freaking out or thinking too big, if you can just lay your brick as perfect as you can, right? And, 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 and it's correct. I think when you wake up tomorrow, we do it collectively, we will have that bridge, right? And so when he said that, I automatically, the light came on and I thought about that, right? Because everything that coaches use in rowing, I'm like, how can I use that lesson outside of the sport, right? To, to get people moving together and get people rowing. So uh, yeah, Mike, Mike's, Mike's great. He's a genius in, in the sport. So um, that, that it, was, it was great to hear. As we wind down on our time, I want to yield the final couple of questions to the audience. Um, for Arche, um, someone today looked up and saw that Manly no longer has a rowing program. Do you know why it's been discontinued? And if you do, how disappointing is that to you? Um, you know, so Manly, after I graduated, this coach came, Coach Tim, he's a black African-American guy. Um, he um, he was there for like a year and he wanted to expand. He, he, he actually changed it to the Chicago Youth Rowing Club and he wanted to give other schools in the community an opportunity to be a part of that team. And so he started recruiting from the surrounding schools and uh, over... Uh, I don't know, maybe five, six years, completely lost funding, right? And, um, but a new program started called the Chicago Training Center at that time. And it still exists today. And that's the program that we work very closely with, right? And, and we have some great things happening this year through a Most Beautiful Thing Inclusion Fund to make sure that we're giving um, kids like at Manly, which Chicago Training Center are really involved with a lot of community schools, uh, just more students opportunities to join the program there. So it really kind of opened up to uh, the, 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 the surrounding schools in, in, in the neighborhood. How do you encourage more students of color to follow the example, not necessarily with rowing, but to try things that society has told them are not for them? Yeah, you know, for me, it's it's it, it's our it's our stories that have always worked. It's our vulnerability. It's really splitting ourselves open and telling them that I've never said the word dad a day in my life. Uh, I fell the eighth grade. 
which is true. Um, my mother was a drug addict. You know, I, 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 I had a lot of fears. I had a lot of insecurities. I, I didn't speak well growing up. But, you know, a group came to my school, gave me an opportunity. And, and, and I did it afraid. Courage is not being fearless, but it's doing it afraid. And our coaches said, I promise you, if you do this, you will succeed if you do this. And, and, and when I tell my story, right, I make sure that we have a staff, we have a group of coaches that will deliver, right, and, and that are passionate, right, and have a plan, and will talk to their parents and tell their parents that we're here to protect you, right? And so it's not really just engaging in the kid. It, we are all about mobilizing a group of people who are going to engage the school, the parents, and the kid. And I think collectively, uh, uh, if we can get the village involved, that we can get the kid involved. Sometimes the kid is scared. Sometimes the kid is, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's just too foreign for them. So I think it's important that we really figure out how to get the whole village involved. People that they trust, people who, you know, the athletic director, right? Uh, that teacher is very important for us before we start something that we get to know the people in the community and the teachers and, and, and the stakeholders there. And the craziness that was 2020 and, and increasingly 2021, uh, what message is do you feel like this story is conveying to society and, and what message do we need to spread? Um, uh, why don't I start Nick? because Arshe, you're gonna you're gonna wax eloquent on this, I know. And I, I think honestly, what we're seeing is greater empathy and understanding of the events of the past, never mind the, the events of the past year but the events of the past month, our society, the fabric of our society is being torn in ways where we are so much more interconnected. We are so much more alike than we are different. And I think certainly this film is helping re-educate uh, people, especially those that live in the world of privilege about how, how lucky that is and how much more needs to be done. And, you know, I think back when I was a little girl, I remember driving, I'm from Boston and, and my mother wasn't malevolent in any way. She wasn't overtly racist, but I remember driving through Roxbury. I was four years old. She said, we're gonna lock the doors. We're going through a bad neighborhood, right? So this kind of thinking in terms of what underprivileged or lack of access means, it's so deeply seated and I think this film is really um, displacing and dispelling and um, really old stereotypes, right? And, and a greater understanding that, that, again, goes back to what I think Arshay said at the top of the program, that talent is equally distributed. How do we create better access and opportunity? And those of us that live in the world of privilege the burden is on us because we've had all of the blessings of um, privilege. And I think two things stick out for me is uh, number one, um, for me, this film is, uh, uh, I would say that in one word, I would say, listen, right? When um, it's about listening, right? And, 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 and listen to the people who are hurting, those who are, are, are struggling, those who are being mistreated and, and, hopefully your moral compass will point you in the right direction, right? I think when George Floyd was murdered, people were like, oh, wow, that do happens. And, but people have been saying it for so long, right? And I think listening is, is, is very important in, in educating yourself and continue to listen um, to these communities. And, uh, and, and that's why we told our story. We just wanted people to listen. And we had these stories for a long time. And now people are listening. Uh, those. Uh, who are old or young or black or white, no matter what, they are listening. And I think the second thing I would say is that we got to where we are because of the village, not just our coaches, right? Um, our teachers, our moms. You know, one of my favorite photos of all time is this turtle that was sitting on the gate. And, and I looked at it, and I knew right away that that turtle didn't get there by itself, right? Someone helped them, someone helped it get there. And, and, and so if we can, we have our jobs and our families, but if we can represent something bigger than ourselves, if we can act beyond ourselves, like our great leaders, like Harriet Tubman was a union spy, but she was known for the freedom that she brought to the world when you think of her name. MLK, an educated preacher, but you think of hope when you 
remember his name, right? Or um, Gandhi, an attorney, but you think about the peace he brought to the world. We can represent something bigger than ourselves, our career, freedom, hope, love, all social justice, true change happens if everyone embraces that. And so um, I think that's what this film's about. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, when people look at Mary Mazio, it's not just a filmmaker, but a person who really brings forth social change, right? And 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 saying with the Kauf, the Kaufman Foundation, you know, it's education. I think about education when I think of them, right? So how can we represent uh, something that's just bigger than our career? And I think that is really going to bring change to our country and our community. We'll wrap it up with this. What's next for you two, the dynamic duo? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let, I'll have, uh, you know, Arshay, you're going to have the last word, um, yeah. but I think, you know, it's so exciting, right? The film is now on Peacock. It began streaming on Amazon Prime. Uh, so to have these partnerships with Comcast, NBC Universal, and, and Amazon, uh, there's going to be a scripted um, project that is also going to take the film and Arshay's book and adapt that uh, with actors. And so that is super crazy exciting. Um, and I think we're seeing all kinds of events, whether it's with Olympic teams, university presidents, uh, brands, fireside chats with CEOs. We're so excited. And certainly I feel at this point in time in history, given the year that it's been to be part of Team Arche and part of a project like this has been so um, rewarding and re-educating for me and, um, and instructive that I too have a long way to go in terms of how much more I can do. Awesome. I think, um, you know, the for me, the future is bright, right? And uh, I believe through our most beautiful thing inclusion fund that we're gonna take rowing to every major city in the country, not in the world. And um, through through rowing, through academic support, through social emotional learning help, through parent support. And, um, you know, and, and I'm excited to use this sport to really uh, give people an opportunity to, to branch out and through entrepreneurship, of course. And, um, and so I'm excited about that. And I think that, you know, one day another book you know, and and uh, and once that book is written, uh, Mary will get another tweet. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm like, this time, you know, this time I want MJ. I want Morgan Freeman narrating. You know, so you know, we gotta try to you know raise the bar a little bit more. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> wait, wait, you don't want, you don't want common? You want Morgan Freeman? <laughs> 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 Mary Arche, on behalf of the KC Public Library and the Kaufman Foundation, I want to thank both of you for stopping by Kansas City. Uh, best of luck to you. I'm sure we'll be speaking again. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much thank for you. having us and great to see you tonight. Thank you to Kaufman <laughs> Foundation as well. Thank you.